here we are with a segment of the show which we are officially naming the Tea Table. For you long-time listeners, this is the old-school discussion segment of the show where we share our long-form thoughts on a specific subject, whether it's, you know, recent news or something in Nintendo's past, something about their games, whatever it may be. So, recently, the Nintendo community exploded over a few images that appeared to show the NX controller with an oval-shaped touchscreen, click-wheel shoulder buttons, and no face buttons. You can check out the images at Gamnesia, of course, but they were confirmed to be fake. The one we talked about last week on the show was an incredible fake job, uh, all done on the computer, and the ones that followed suit were 3D printed units based on the same model. So, if these things are confirmed fake, why bother talking about them, right? Well. We know that they're based directly off the patents that Nintendo recently filed for a new controller. So much so, in fact, that they're almost the spitting image, albeit polished up, of course, to look like a finished project and not just pencil lines. Uh, But we also know that the editor-in-chief of Game Informer heard information that he couldn't confirm previously that the NX controller has no face buttons. All this is to say, this may not be the NX controller, but there's a very good chance that the real thing will be something very similar at least in concept, if not in appearance as well. So, all of us in the Nintendo community are gonna have to start getting used to this idea now if we don't want to risk having a terrible E3. Uh, But the good news is that this controller could actually be an incredible idea. So Alex here is incredible at taking Nintendo's wacky concepts and explaining them in a way that does justice to why they just might be brilliant. And he actually came out with one of his legendary editorials on the subject, so be sure to check that out. But uh, Alex, I'll let you take it away. So... I've got a lot to say, and a lot of it will be context for kind of why I think the idea is actually not half bad. So mm-hmm. if you guys uh, want to jump in, just do so at any time. Okay. Um, so I think at first glance, when a lot of people saw this design, they probably thought something like, how am I going to use a controller that doesn't have any buttons, any physical buttons? Right. Uh, and if you start from that assumption that f- fixed button inputs are what make a game controller, that they're necessary for video games, of course you're going to feel that way. But uh, one thing that we are seeing in today's video game market is that is that is no longer the default assumption. In fact, it's probably more accurate at this point to say that most video games don't actually require button inputs mm-hmm. because they use touchscreens. Yeah, people seem generally happy with those touchscreen games, so it makes. And to clarify, these are you know this is a much wider audience. This isn't the traditional gaming audience. These are the people who graduated from Wii to mobile devices. These are the people who decided you know. I love video games, but I can't figure out these controllers. The smartphone in my pocket has billions of apps that are, there are lots of great games there, and that's how they get their primary gaming needs. So for traditional gamers in that sense, uh, yeah, it doesn't make sense to hear those kinds of comments, but remember, there's lots of other video games out there. This isn't just about the home console AAA experiences, this is about gaming as a whole. Right. And as Nintendo showed with the Wii, they're they're trying to bring in non-traditional gamers into the sort of gaming fold. So. Exactly. Yeah, so kind of in light of what you guys just said, uh, Nintendo's space in this modern gaming market is kind of weird. Because on the one hand, they've been this longtime legacy player in video game hardware for like more than 30 years at this point. Mm-hmm. So based on that history, they have a lot of expectations about what kind their games are supposed to be like, uh, how their game controllers should be. Uh, But on the other hand, you have their two most major competitors, uh, Sony and Microsoft. Uh, They've kind of established a standardized baseline for what a controller should be. Uh, Dual analog, four face buttons, uh, two shoulder buttons on each side. And that's kind of dominated the uh, home console and PC gaming markets that we kind of now find ourselves in. And Mm -hmm. on, you know, yet another hand, you now have that new mobile market that's now absorbing most of the uh, new players that Nintendo kind of draws on with each new console. And that's, you know, young kids and and family gamers. Yeah. Now, Nintendo kind of saw that this was happening to them uh, with uh, machines like N64 and GameCube. And so looking back on what they did with DS and Wii, those platforms were able to succeed because they were throwing out all the conventional wisdom that their competitors were using for their controllers. Uh, right, Nintendo. and not just those systems. The NES did that. I mean, that's yeah. they've been iterating hardware for a long time. They've always been doing wacky shit with their controllers. The NES controller was totally revolutionary. That's basically the father of the modern game. The N sixty four controller was designed for aliens. Yeah, <laughs> that was exactly my next point. <laughs> basically, the Super Nintendo controller and the GameCube controller are the only ones that iterated rather than rethought what a controller was supposed to be. Right. Right. 
And even the Game Boy, uh, in terms of display technology, all of its competitors were trying to use color screens, and it decided, oh, well, we don't need a color screen. We just need kind of more diverse games than what they were seeing on other on other machines. And we don't need the, the screen to do that. We just kind of need a, a machine that's easy to use and cheap. Mm-hmm. Very cheap. Um, anyway, very, very, very cheap. So the question that they started with when they were making DS and Wii was, do these fancy, complicated uh, bells and whistles that we see on modern controllers really make gaming better? And in particular, do they really make gaming better for everyone? Or could they make more people happy by making a new kind of interface that's designed for all those everyday people who are kind of falling through the cracks, who aren't really familiar with with those kinds of game controls? Mm -hmm. And so you had Nintendo pioneering the first major use of a touchscreen in a video game system, not focusing on bringing, you know, like like the PSP did, uh, not focusing on bringing more stuff over from console controllers onto the handhelds. The PSP had that nub, if you remember, and DS had no analog control whatsoever. It had the touchscreen. Um, and then after that, they made the Wii controller, which was a controller that w- was designed to be as easy to use as a TV remote. Right. And the interesting thing I think about these kinds of control inputs is that, you know, a lot of people are saying about this idea of an NX controller that it doesn't make sense to simplify things because it's going to be stripping away features. But you look at stuff like the DS, the Wii, maybe they w- won't be quite as simplified as what a proposed NX controller could look like, but they made hardcore gamers who traditionally stuck with Nintendo happy. You look at games like Twilight Princess, you look at games like Mario Galaxy, you look at games like the Pokemon games on DS, Super Mario 64 DS, lots and lots of games made use of these features in ways that made it simple and accessible for widespread audiences and still kept their core fan base really, really happy. Metroid Prime Trilogy. I mean, just look at how great that one was. Yeah, and if if there were games that made players unhappy, it's because those games were lower quality. A good example exactly. being Metroid Other M. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. But these kinds of innovations can simplify things and make them a lot more accessible for a lot wider audiences of people without stripping away features. In fact, they can do it by innovating features and making them more rich. Or making them more usable to people that don't really see buttons as the ideal way to control their exactly. consumer electronics. Right. Which kind of brings me back around to the whole idea of having a controller with a touchscreen on it. Uh, you may think that Nintendo already tried this. They made the Wii U gamepad. <laughs> um, but, of course, anyone who's actually used a Wii U gamepad knows it's not really as easy to use as a, a smartphone or even a TV remote. Right. Um, it's still got all the baggage from other controllers. Mm-hmm. It just has a TV screen in the middle of it. And even though that screen's a touchscreen, that screen is also not as easy to use as a phone screen. Uh, because the controller right. itself is really bulky. Um, it's really hard to really make use of the touchscreen while holding the thing with both hands, which is not true for a phone. Um, so it's it's not a solution to the problem of making things usable for people who are used to touchscreens. It, right, it's, exactly. It's an inferior controller for people who like touchscreens. It's inferior to touchscreens, and it's inferior to a normal traditional gaming controller. I mean, as much as someone might like the touch input and off-TV play, you got to recognize that's something Nintendo fans love, but it's not something that everyone can love. Right. So that brings us to this new controller design, where the touchscreen, rather than being an embedded feature in a traditional controller, is now the bread and butter of the controller. You still have the analog sticks, so you can still have the kind of fine character control that you don't really get on a mobile phone. But, you know, just having two analog sticks isn't necessarily going to be completely outlandishly complicated to a a new player. Um, They can try out the analog sticks, and that's the only new thing they have to pick up, Mm -hmm. uh, depending on how the game is designed, of course. Um, It's just that now you also have this great touchscreen that we would want to hope is just as responsive and just as easy to use as the touchscreens on their phones. Right. That opens up a lot of gameplay possibilities. Like one that came to mind that I didn't mention in the article because I wanted to save it for the podcast because I love you guys Aww. is um, in Pikmin, uh, they made an effort to uh, introduce a touch option for Pikmin 3 kind of posthumously. And the way it worked was you held one hand on the analog sticks and used kind of a stylus with the other hand. But you wouldn't need to control it that way on this controller. You could hold the controller in both hands and just reach out, reach your thumbs over to the screen every time you need to, you know, tap to throw a Pikmin. Mm -hmm. So it would really make 
good use of interplay between sticks and maybe the triggers and a touchscreen. It wouldn't be difficult to use. It, you wouldn't have to hold the controller in a weird way comp- compared to a tra- traditional right. controller. And at the same time, it would work in very much the same way that people's phones do. Right. Nice. And and I think that the best potential for this thing is in a handheld gaming device specifically. Yeah, I agree with that too. That may well be what the patent is for anyway, you know? We don't know that it's specifically just a controller for a home console. But I think that given how much we've been hearing about the NX and the way that it aims to merge their handheld and home console devices, that it's safest to assume that whatever this patent comes to be would work essentially like the handheld component of an NX that works more like a traditional console. So you can take this thing on the road to play your games and even to use it as a controller for the NX in the living room, but that it won't be just the controller for a home console system. It'll be a handheld in many ways its own right, uh, and that the home console can also have other more traditional controls. Obviously, if they just make it the controller, then the core gaming audience is going to blow a gasket. The casual audience won't understand it at all, and that's just going to be a whole other nightmare. So, yeah, after all the confusion with Wii U, I would like to think that Nintendo has learned and wouldn't sort of repeat that same mistake. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, yeah, I think and, I think you guys are, are both right in that this would be ideal as a kind of Nintendo version of a mobile device that can right. also cross over to your console if you happen to have both. Exactly. Um, I, I really don't think that it would fix the problem they had with Wii U in terms of the controller adding so much to the cost of the hardware that they had to actually uh, bootstrap right. the hardware. Um, right. So from that perspective, yeah, it would be, really, be a really big problem if they banked on this idea. And then the idea, let's just say, made the console too expensive for the the experiences that it's offering. Right. And I think they recognize that. I think they know that. I don't think they're stupid enough to do that kind of thing. But, uh... Yeah, but but this controller is, you know, it's a really sleek, functional design. It looks very much on par with the devices that are popular today, like smartphones, like you're talking about. Um, And I think that that's one of the biggest benefits of an NX that features a handheld component like this thing, is that all of these innovations in the controls are designed with the goal to move gaming forward and make it more accessible. Um, And I think that a lot of people fear that these kinds of changes, like no face buttons, will end up dumbing down gaming. But I think there's real potential for it to advance gaming. The best design innovations ever are always the ones that make things more intuitive and yet more feature-rich at the same time. Uh, You know, as we were just talking about with the examples a moment ago uh, for the control schemes, these kinds of dynamic inputs let players control more features more precisely and more easily. Think about scrolling through items in Zelda, think about scrolling through weapons in Fire Emblem, just by dragging your finger along where it already is, just a tad. Um, You know, think about the not having to reach all the way over to reach different parts of the touchscreen. and if you, if you read the article, there are much, much richer explanations of other kinds of control schemes too, uh, like using Mario with just the two sticks. Um, there's a lot of really great potential in this kind of a control scheme. And, you know, it's, it's about more features, more precisely, more easily. So everyone has a better experience, traditional gamers included. And, and that's why I'm really fascinated and really hopeful, honestly, that the real deal is a lot like these fakes. Because if you couple that with how beautifully this kind of device fits into uh, modern mass market consumer electronics like the iPhone, uh, the portable version of NX could be a wildly successful platform for the handheld side of gaming. And then the core fans who really want the TV experience and the dedicated home console setup can enjoy it all the same. It's utterly brilliant, honestly. Yeah, um, I agreed with, with 100% of what you just said. (laughs) Um, Now, I think another interesting question to tackle is, you know, how well could this controller handle the kinds of traditional inputs that people kind of expect to see from their more complicated games? Right, right. One of the big examples is Smash Bros. How would this work? Um, Right. I guess the question is, you know, if Nintendo's really serious about trying to to do more with fewer fixed inputs, so that's buttons, um, I'd imagine that they'd be really interested in tackling ways to give you the same number of actions, yeah. but, you know, doing it in such a way that requires fewer buttons. Absolutely. Um, and, you know, you, you look at more complex games like Smash. I actually, in the comments section of this article, I proposed a control scheme on this purported sort of device um, for Smash Bros. that could work. Uh, check that out if you're interested. Um, but I think the real point to draw from that is that even the most complicated games 
With creativity and ingenuity, they can come up with a control scheme that actually works really, really well with this thing. Yep. And that'll be a big thing, just like, you know, Wii U before it and Wii before that is, it's definitely a really interesting idea, but implementation is going to be huge. You know, they gotta, they got to nail this. Yeah, Absolutely. They, they, they do have to be really thoughtful about what they can do without kind of the extra inputs that people expect. Uh, right, one option, right. of course, is to have touchscreen buttons, and if the haptic technology really is where it needs to be, that's a possibility. Uh, I don't think Nintendo would try that if the haptic technology weren't good enough to actually replace a button. So well, that- and who knows? You know, a lot of the things that they could be designing might not even need haptic technology. They could just use touchscreen inputs for not not inputs that need action, but rather just something like selecting an item. Yeah, a good example actually is you know. It's very rare that you'll use the A button in a Zelda game uh, for anything that would require necessarily precise timing. The one thing I can think of is maybe dodging enemies in battle, but you could easily use a different button for that. I don't know. I've devised some amazing roll text, dude. Eh, I think rolling. <laughs> I think I think rolling's a little outdated, honestly. I, well, obviously. Uh, but... but you know, when you're talking to someone, you could just tap the screen. Uh, if you want to <laughs> pick up an item, you could just. Like like a jar, for example, you could just tap the jar to pick it up, tap again to throw mm-hmm. it. Like that's not something that requires a button and precise timing. Yeah, you know, maybe throwing a bomb, you don't necessarily need uh, a precise timing or a button for that. You just need mm-hmm. kind of to line yourself up in a certain way, tap where you want to throw, and it goes there. Right. Uh, it, they could have traditional aiming controls, but for people who are familiar with touch devices, maybe you pull out your bow and you tap an enemy and you shoot it. Like. There are lots of ways that they can make uh, really good use of the, the, the touch interface to do the yeah. actions that would traditionally be associated with buttons. Yeah, we're going a little over time here. Uh, is there anything else that's really pressing that people want to say, or should we move on to the mystery house? I'm good to move on. I have a All lot right. of really miscellaneous other things that, about this idea that uh, I really like, <laughs> but uh, yeah, it, they're not they're not pressing or anything. Uh-huh. All right. Um, yeah, so we got to wrap it up a little bit here in this segment, but um, check out Alex's article for sure if you're interested in this kind of stuff. Whether or not Nintendo could implement it is maybe a whole other discussion of its own, because um, that does open a lot of... It's a huge can of worms, basically. Um, but at least in theory, this kind of idea could be really, really fantastic. Um, and I guess uh, something that I think is a really good conclusion to this discussion is something that I've heard uh, a couple commenters, maybe even just one repeating it, uh, but say on Gamnesia a lot, you know, If anybody has the right to innovate the basic traditional gaming controller, it's Nintendo. I mean, just look at how amazingly successful they were with the NES, with the DS, with the Wii. They've done it before, so they've earned the right. Yeah, and I'll I'll sort of reiterate something you said before and and say that people see the NES as being a very traditional console, but when it first debuted, it was oh my god, it was a it was a Wii style revolution. It really was. Yeah, yeah. So. Hello, everybody. Thank you for listening to this Nintendo Week Clip NWC. If you like what you hear, please subscribe to us here on YouTube for more highlights and discussion videos from Nintendo Week Podcast, or subscribe to us on iTunes for weekly breakdowns of all your Nintendo news, discussion segments on subjects, games, and more, and tons of other features. Thanks for listening, and we will see you tomorrow with another NWC.